Hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon and uh, good good evening for those joining from Europe. I'm Val Mukherjee. Um, I'm moderating this session from beautiful Wichita uh, Falls. Uh, learn how to work with the uh, with the platforms, with the resources we got, and uh, of course, the most important uh, aspect of this is we are all connected in cyberspace. Each of the panelists here have a great uh, deal of experience and and expertise in um, um, in in the topic. Um, we are talking about uh, three aspects of it. One is the policy. Second is is uh, general norms and rules, and the third is about building trust and resilience. Um, and as we go uh, through the session today, uh, we will touch upon each of these uh, from the perspectives of the, pa of the of the panelists who are with us uh, today. Uh, I'll just uh, you know introduce them by name, and then we'll go have a quick thirty second intro from each of them. Actually, it would take probably a lot longer to to kind of poke, do justice to the backgrounds, but uh, uh, we will just uh, take that and then we'll move into the topics. So I'll go alphabetically here. Uh, uh, we have Andrea Bonim Blanc. Um, uh, who's a who's the CEO of uh, the GE Series Advisory and a distinguished uh, and a, um, author and speaker about um, ESG and T. Uh, we have Chris Painter, uh, uh, you America's first uh, cyber diplomat and also a long time uh, career uh, diplomat and uh, and uh, justice uh, uh, systems uh, practitioner. We have Jim Pushback, who's CEO of uh, of uh, Ports uh, Port San Antonio. Uh, we have Frank Bond Seth. And uh, Norma, uh, good friend Norma Cram uh, from uh, Von Sero. So, uh, uh, do you, Andrea, first to get a quick introduction, and then we'll follow by Chris, Jim, Frank, and Norma. Thank you so much, Val, and it's great to be with this wonderful group. Um, so, my background is I started life as a lawyer, uh, at least my professional life. And uh, slowly but surely entered the executive world and the corporate world, uh, was a general counsel, and then increasingly changed my stripes to cover a lot of the ESG issues that we're talking about today uh, in today's world. Um, and I was a chief risk officer, compliance, ethics, et cetera. And one day they gave me information security to be in charge of as well. Uh, at a technology company, and that was my maiden voyage into cybersecurity and really being a chief information security officer, if you want to call it that. And then since I started my own business, I'm kind of helping executives and boards from the outside looking in and helping them with uh, cyber risk governance, cyber resilience building. And I also teach a course at NYU that's all about cyber leadership, resilience and risk oversight. And I live in New York City, as you can tell from the sirens behind me, um, but uh, I'm part of the Cyber Future Foundation uh, board and really uh, enjoy the incredibly multifaceted views that we hear. And so thank you for having me today. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, Chris Painter, I'm uh, currently the president of the uh, Global Forum on Cyber Expertise, which is a worldwide uh, cyber capacity building coordination uh, group. Uh, I was in the government, the U.S. government, for about 28 years. I, too, am a recovering lawyer. Uh, so uh, I started at least my government career as a federal prosecutor doing cybercrime back in the, in the 90s, including big high-profile cases at that time when people didn't care about it as much. Uh, then I moved to the mothership at the Justice Department in D.C. and ran the Computer Crime and Intellectual Property Section and helped run it. Then I moved to the FBI. Uh, for a short time as a deputy assistant director in their cyber division, then the White House creating the cyber directorate there. And then finally, uh, as Val mentioned, to the State Department, where I was, I think, that one of the first cyber diplomats in the world, and now there are about 40 of them around the world. So uh, probably been involved in this area now 30 years. Hey, I'm uh, Jim Perschbach with Port San Antonio, also a lawyer. Glad to see so many good folks on this uh, panel here today. <laughs> Came out of the aviation and defense world, really knew very little about cyber. Those will know, know me will tell you that I kind of laugh to computer people, but have become a big believer because of the interconnectivity in so many industries. 
and how what we are talking about with cyber and the convergence of systems really impacts everything that we're doing in the world today. So I'm thrilled to be on here. I'm <laughs> anyway, I'm um, glad to be here. Frank von Zeit, my name, and, and I'm joining out of Europe, so it's in Vienna. So we have it uh, 10 o'clock now. Um, so once, once this is over, I, I might have a chance to go to bed. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm very happy being part of, of this group and, and um, uh, in, in this very important, on this very important topic. Um, previously to, to being part, uh, being CEO of, of Cyan, which, which is a, a technology company, uh, I used to work in the, the finance industry, um, more on the side of, um, uh, consulting, um, for a very large, uh, um, American corporation, um, with three letters, um, serving uh, insurance companies, um, and it's going to be part of a big merger. So you might know who it is. Um, and, and cybersecurity and cyber has been a, a massive topic um, all over the place with small and medium-sized companies. So I'm coming with a background of um, understanding what are their triggers or what is their, their, their what are the problems, and most of all, how complex um, the topic cyber is, and 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 how big the word cyber could be, and how how misunderstood it is very often. And now I have a chance to, to join a company who is trying to protect people, individual, um, for that. And um, I think that's a, it's a big task, not only as a, a running a company, but as part of a, um, a society topic, uh, which actually is, is uh, important to each and every one. So I'm, I'm glad to be here and I'm, I'm happy to, to speak with all of you. Great. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Norma Krayam. I'm the Vice President of Cybersecurity, Privacy, and Digital Innovation at Van Squake Associates, and I specialize in working with owners and operators of critical infrastructure to both manage their domestic but their global risk, thinking about broader policy issues, compliance, and certainly regulatory issues. Uh, and like many, I, I worked in the executive branch I, I keep saying I survived four federal agencies, but I started at the Department of Commerce doing international trade negotiations. I worked at the State Department a much shorter time than than Chris did working on G7 issues. The first year we allowed Russia in. Uh, I worked at FEMA and I was at the U.S. Department of Transportation as a deputy chief of staff. And it was really within that structure, within the federal government, that I really focused on critical infrastructure, global national security and homeland security risks and learn the many tools of negotiating bilateral, multilateral agreements, uh, which are torturous, Chris knows better again than anybody, uh, but are very important. Um, I will say this, it is, uh, I created my cybersecurity practice in 2005, uh, when I was in a law firm, but not a lawyer. Uh, and it was really interesting having running a practice now full time for over 15 years, trying to get critical infrastructure to really understand how to manage and defend against the risk. So this is a great discussion today. And I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you very much for the for the introductions. Uh, uh, I, I think we have two very important topics to go through today. Uh, one is around the, the the situation that we have with the policy gaps, and each of you are probably in your own uh, perspective and sphere have your own expectation as well as expertise. Uh, let's start with that. Uh, in terms of policy gaps, uh, what do you think that need to be addressed in such a way that? I mean, risks can be minimized, right? I mean, this is more of a risk management issue right now, and I wish that it would have been started with that way. But uh, uh, I, I would like to get your thinking on how can you minimize risks, uh, in, in, you know, uh, to the, from the policy angle, and then we'll go through the trust and the resiliency angle and we'll go through. And uh, maybe, Andrea, you go, you, you, you start with you and then go around the uh, uh, speaker circle. Sure thing. Um, you know, my experience is mainly in the private sector and nonprofit sector, although I do have some government uh, clients. Um, but the, the real nub of the matter is that in each organization, if they don't have proper enterprise risk management in place, they can't even begin to start thinking about cyber risk management. And so for me, that is one of the stepping stones or the most fundamental things that needs to happen at the organizational level. Um, and that includes the government. And we've seen the government itself 
in, in our own case here in the United States, having some serious um, risk management issues in terms of protecting themselves against uh, outside uh, malign actors. And so if we can't even get our own house uh, in order uh, organizationally and governmentally, uh, it becomes a really serious issue in terms of being able to do policy properly. So I always start from a place of enterprise risk management, of resilience building of your own organization in order to be able to do uh, the work that you need to do with others. And that spills over into uh, private public partnerships as well as intergovernmental relations and policies. And so I think we have a lot of work to do to um, build our own resilience internally, uh, organizationally, uh, agency-wise, and then vis-a-vis uh, -vis other countries and other entities. So that would be my pearl of wisdom, if it's one at all. <laughs> um, I guess I'm next. Um, look, I think there's a lot, unfortunately. I, 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 let me start with this. Um, you know, what I really hate to hear uh, when we've had some of these major cyber events recently, like the solar winds attack and the Microsoft Exchange server intrusions, um, is that it's a wake up call because we've had hundreds of wake up calls. And I feel sometimes like we're hamsters on a wheel and we're not making the progress we need to make. And I think core to that is really treating this issue of cybersecurity as a core you know, on the government level, a core national security issue, a core economic issue core human rights and foreign policy issue, and not some boutique uh, technical issue, which too often it's, it's treated as. Uh, on the corporate level, the same thing. I think, you know, certainly the tech industry gets this, but a lot of companies at, at the C-suite level really don't embrace this or understand it completely or really treat it as a risk management issue. You know, it shouldn't be that your, uh, your, your, uh, your, your cyber, uh, uh, in, you know, your CISO, uh, state gets to keep their job. If nothing happens, if something happens, they lose their job. That's not risk management. So looking at this as not something that's really bizarre and technical, but something that although you need to understand the technical components, you really need to make this part of your overall policy. And that, you know, I, on the government level, I feel more hopeful because the new administration, I think, has a lot of folks who are dedicated to this and who have backgrounds in this at the, you know, the head of Homeland Security, who was a prosecutor with me back in the day in Los Angeles, uh, Ali Mayorkas has dealt with these issues. The National Security Advisor has, the Secretary of State has, so that's good. Uh, the, other, the other gap, I think, is just uh, doing more international cooperation to actually not just agree on what the rules of the road are, and that's been happening, but make sure that there is accountability and consequences for those that, that, that violate them, especially nation states. And I think we haven't gotten there. And the third really is what my one of my big jobs is now, which is capacity building, making sure that uh, countries, individuals around the world really are understanding the nature of this issue, have things like uh, institutions, have cybercrime laws, have ways to respond to incidents. Uh, have national strategies so we can work together because this is not an issue that is uh, unique to any one country or one company. I think those are uh, great points. I, I'm going to look at it from a much less technical standpoint. I, I think there are two big challenges with cybersecurity. The first challenge is it is being too difficult to understand, people don't comply with it. If the tools that you need to use are cumbersome and get in the way of doing business, people don't comply with it. If you can't memorize passwords, I've had requirements for passphrases that I can't even for the life of me figure out how to make one that passes the, uh, the smell test. Nobody's going to comply with it. The flip side is it becomes so scary and such a aspect of international crime and things behind the scenes that people don't understand that a lot of this is just basic security hygiene. It's no different than locking your door, or not leaving things out in the car when you see them. And from a policy perspective, I'd like to see cybersecurity taken away from some of the technical aspects and presented not just to policymakers, but frankly to regular folks as a common 
I, I can't tell you how many times I've heard the horror stories of people walking around on FaceTime in their offices, getting, I get on these Zoom calls all the time and I look behind somebody and I see their whiteboard with all their project deadlines up there. Uh, a lot of this has nothing to do with technical aspects. It just has to do with basic cybersecurity. So finding that sweet spot between not making things so technical and scary that people can't comply or won't comply, but by the same time, making it so that people understand a lot of this really is common sense. Thank you, Jim. I, I fully agree with what, what you what you just said, and I, I came across um, the, the cyber topic seven eight years ago, and it was a, basically a, a topic for major uh, companies, big enterprises, or governments who have been attacked, and it was it was a little bit out of the space, and it looked like the uh, um, a future movie um, from from outside. Um, everyone was was looking like like a Star Wars and 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 things like that, uh, but it was it was not touching me me as a person. And um, over the years, um, the topic was always man, uh, uh, managed by by the CTOs or the CISOs um, in the companies. And now it has already become a, a CEO or a CFO topic. So that it has grown in the latter because of the importance. Nevertheless, it's not only the big um, big corporations. It's not not the governments who have to deal with that. It's 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 going now further down. And with with the pandemic, we have seen this more and more that small and medium sized uh, companies have been attacked. And not only them. It's us as individuals who who are more and more in the focus of any um, any any topics uh, concerning cyber. On the other hand, cyber is it's it's a it's a it's a word which is so abstract. And it's so uh, not touchable. It's not tangible. It's nothing where we, where we can see where the risk is coming from. It's something which is in the space. It is, it is not there for, for obvious reasons. Similar like Corona. It's not there. And we only feel it when we, when we are hit. And, 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 and therefore it's, it's, some people ignore it. And I, the awareness of, of the whole topic needs to start from, from the very first beginning. If, if, I, if I look at, at, at schools, if I look at the most vulnerable, these are the children who are the next generation of using Internet and using all the mobile devices and communication through this, they are, the, they are vulnerable and, and they need to be educated in what they are doing. And, and, and they need to understand of what they are doing. And it's not just a, a local issue. It's not something which can be handled only in the US, only in Europe, only there. It's, it's, a, it's a global topic where the combination of, of governments, um, policies, the combination of um, enterprises, um, cybersecurity companies like, like us, um, but as well, um, um, schools and, and educational uh, institutions, they have to come together, form a language which people understand, not making them scary. I mean, it's a little bit like driving a car. You're on the road from A to B. Either you enjoy it or you have to do this. And, and you, you put your seatbelt on. Yeah, it's a normal practice to put your seatbelt on. And that's something needs to be... Um, um, translated to each and every individual because we cannot ignore cyber will be part of our life. Yeah. It's something like the storms and, and, and the, the natural hazards, uh, which are going to happen are part of our normal life. We have to adapt to it. We have to deal with, it, we have to understand this. And once we have understood it, it takes off the fear. And once we are not fear anymore, we are dealing with, with different things. Sure. Think, Education and, and technology and, and prevention and, and uh, financial uh, uh, security, all these kind of things will exist and continue, but it needs a, a common understanding of the topic itself, a better preparation for that. And then I think we can deal with this topic much more in a, in a, in a better way, in a much easier way where people understand and, and how to deal with that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Frank. Norma? You know, I agree with all that. When I think about the policy gaps and managing the risk, I, I, I sort of have my top five list. 
you know, really the first issue that I help companies look at and, and is, to, is to do everything that you all have talked about, which is deconstruct what the risk means. It doesn't mean that you have to be the, you know, the pure technical cybersecurity person, but you have to understand what cybersecurity is. And then you deconstruct the risk across whatever enterprise we're talking about. So if you're talking about a hospital, right, there's a very specific level of risk that goes into health and safety. But if you're a bank, if you're an airline, if you're a port, you know, um, any parts of critical infrastructure, you just have to understand how they run and operate and then manage the risk throughout the enterprise. I mean, I can explain cybersecurity risk to the HR professional just as much as the CEO, but it has to be tailored to, to who they are and what they do. And that helps a lot more for them to understand and can have that little aha moment. I think the second issue is that you need to understand where you sit in the universe vis-a-vis -vis our economy, um, our security and other things. You know, your risk is someone else's risk as well. And I think people need to understand where they fit in that broader ecosystem. Um, the third is just because you can connect it all, why? You know, we're talking about IoT risk, global risk. I mean, technology is a cool, sexy thing, but think about that risk before you start plugging everything together. Um, I, we should have figured that one out by now. Four, you know, we need to look at supply chain security issues, and we'll, I'm sure we'll talk about that. Solar Winds has taught everyone that. But again, you know, look at look at your supply chain. Look at who you rely on. And I think the last, uh, the fifth big policy gap for me is we're still trying to work out and assign roles and responsibilities for especially private sector and critical infrastructure about who should manage the risk. I mean, the expectation now is that every single company and entity should know that they have it. But there is still this line I like to draw, which says, you know, from from here up, companies own that risk. They have a responsibility. But from here up is that partnership with the federal government, in our case, the U.S. government or governments around the world to manage and deal with nation state risk. Because the most sophisticated company who spends billions of dollars on security is still not going to be able to withstand what I call the, the nation state equivalent of a tank coming down my door. So we still have to work that out. Nobody still knows who's on first if there's a, a global cybersecurity attack. And I think if SolarWinds doesn't teach us anything uh, and Microsoft 365, then we should all go home. But it, it's time. And I think the new Biden-Harris administration understands that and we will see more uh, of a plan and consequences for nation state actions. So uh, thank you all. I think that all, all valid points in terms of the perspective that you bring both in terms of, uh, you know, how to simplify this in terms of hygiene, but also to make sure that uh, the policies that we follow have their sphere of influence and also the, the accountability. And finally, the consequences laid out properly, right? And I think there's a lot of work to do in that space. Well, uh, you know, that leads me to the next uh, uh, set of questions around how do we build trust to achieve all that, right? Because cyberspace is uh, borderless. There is no boundary. And uh, probably, you know, as a diplomat, uh, Chris probably attested that uh, the amount of effort that it takes to get people agree on one thing and build on cyberspace is, is extremely um, tough. And this is not possible without having trust. So what are your thoughts in terms of trust building efforts that we need to have with this new administration? At least, you know, that's kind of... Uh, the Soros is meeting being about Americas, um, and uh, you know this administration definitely has a lot of different angle than, than previous administration or administrations. So your thoughts, uh, and maybe we start with Chris. Uh, this is a uh, this is a pretty solid uh, you know All area right. of yours. Sure, I mean I I think there are different kinds of trust we're talking about. One is when we're talking about the public and the private sector. There we're. We've talked about this for so many years, it's just become a mantra, this idea of public-private partnership in this area between government and the private sector. And we seldom really define what we mean by that. So, you know, the, it comes down to information sharing, but information sharing about what? You know, what's going to be useful to the private sector in responding to these various cyber incidents and what's going to be useful to the government? Uh, I think we're still living in a world, unfortunately, which has been long held where a lot of the private sector Participants don't trust the government, don't think that they're going to protect their information, think they're going to be further victimized. And the government doesn't know really what to ask the private sector for. And so I, I do think there's, you know, some efforts now in this administration to put some meat around that, make it more uh, tactical and, and make it useful. It's not easy to do, but we also have to do that not just to fight the nation state threats, but also the criminal threats. I mean, ransomware is a huge issue right now, for instance. And we need to be able to deal with that. And I totally agree. We can't 
take this this approach of trying to scare people because you want to be you want to make people aware that the threat is, but if they, they just throw up their hands and say there's nothing I can do, that doesn't help you. You know, I, I also think that we have to demystify what this cyber thing is. Uh, so if it's seen as a scary technical thing, we're not going to get the traction we need. We need to kind of put it in words that ordinary either C-suite folks or policymakers can understand. You don't need to be a coder. You need to have people around to understand this, but you don't need to be a coder, just like you don't need to be a nuclear engineer uh, to do nuclear policy. So I think that's going to be important too. And then, and then I do think that, you know, um, there is rebuilding trust with our allies and partners on, on the international scale. We have lost a lot of that over the last four years. Uh, whether you agree or not with the last administration, the kind of America first attitude and various things that had nothing to do with cyber trade and other policies, I think made it harder for us to have this collective approach to these cyber threats. And that's where we're strongest, when we have a collective approach rather than just the U.S. alone and building those alliances and that collective response to, to you know, all the things we're seeing, because in you know, if the bad actors in a nation state, we know who they are. It's Russia, it's China, it's North Korea, it's Iran, uh, so that we take action together. Uh, and if they're criminals, we work together on that, too. So I think that's going to be an important part of the administration going forward, too. And there's a role for the private sector there, too. Yeah, no, I think, uh, you know, the, the whole public-private partnership uh, takes on a completely different level when we, when we consider uh, cyber. Well, uh, let me let me punt it over to Jim for, for your thoughts around uh, uh, the trust building, you know, at the C-suite and the C-level. How can we make sure that happens? I, I think uh, from a government perspective, the, the government needs to show that it is serious about this. If there are criminal attacks that are made upon businesses, upon individuals that are stealing information, that are stealing property, that in some cases are damaging property, then there needs to be a serious treatment of that the same way that there would be if there was a physical attack on somebody. It, it is troubling. You, you know, the response to a lot of ransomware attacks right now is pay the ransom. There's not much we can do, but pay the ransom. It is really hard to go back to somebody and say that we are treating this seriously when you are writing big checks to, to criminals. I don't believe that most of this is being done by, by nation states. I, I think it probably is largely criminal syndicates. But we need to be working with our allied nations out there. We need to be working with other nations to have somewhat of a unified approach to these criminal attacks. And then candidly, I suspect that there are attacks originating out of this country as well. And we have to be just as serious in prosecuting those attacks when they're coming out of the United States as we are asking other nations. Yeah, no, uh, thank you. I think uh, that that's uh, really useful. Uh, Frank, how about you um, and your thoughts around uh, uh, the more broader angle, both as a, as a C-suite executive as well as from a technology sector? Well, I mean, we, we have to um, recognize now that um, cyber attacks and the criminal uh, effect is actually more attractive um, than the drug dealing right now. Yeah, so the, 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 the criminal um, um, mentality has changed. It is. It is. It's. It's. It's a clean, um, very easy, or somehow easy when you know and when you understand the, the technology um, uh, way to to harm people um, and damage the economy here, um, and that has a is a is, is is something which is somehow I have the feeling uh, widely accepted. While when you when you when you deal with drugs, then you have all these these. Um, um, bloody images in 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 mind, um, but but cyber attacks is clean. I mean, you're writing an email and you say transfer this because I have your assets, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and then you, you you go away and you, everything is in in the crypto world um, um, in or in space. Um, and and here we have to to be aware that that those kind of things have a massive impact on on our not only economy but on the society as well and. Here we have to form um, certain rules, which are common rules, which are not only a rule of one country. That needs to be written down um, from 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 a from a whole um, 
from the pl planet or from the universe, or whatever you would like to call it, yeah, because it's 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 a matter of fact that it is um, impacting us all at the same way, and we are connected through this topic. Yeah, I mean, we are connected through the internet, so it's not there is not one America, one US, or one 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 Europe, or one Asia. We are connected through this, and we are impacted by this, and and those kind of forces needs to as well um, to establish. A certain um, uh, policy. Um, it needs to have uh, laws in, in in place. It needs to have um, um, jurisdictions in place where you where you deal with that, and not where each and every country deal it on its own, more or less how they like it. And I would I would think that that will already make people aware of it, how to deal with this. And we have to build on work on the language because language is a topic to understand what is. What it's all about. It, it helps to prevent um, um, uh, things. It helps to to organize people together, and and don't see it as I said before as an ab abstract topic, uh, which does not uh, affect me or my my neighbor or whoever. And if so, well, bad luck. Yeah. So th that's something very important that we have a common understanding of the topic itself before creating big laws. But on the other hand, it needs to be an and a multinational um, uh, uh, agreement rather than in, uh, a singular um, topic where each and every country deals on its own because what we see with a pandemic, it's chaos, yeah, because everyone is handling the, 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 the pandemic um, in, in, in its own way, but it affects when one person travels to the next country, it has an in, it immediately effect because no one has it under control, yeah, and we we have to have here a little bit more more common rules here. Good, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Bank. Norma, how about your thoughts on the trust building size? You know, it, this is one of those panels where you say I agree with what everyone said before because it's true. Um, I think there are three levels of trust that that need to be established or solidified. You know, number one, consumers need to trust that the products and services. Um, that they're buying and are using are safe and secure. Um, we need to, tr consumers need to trust that when they go into a hospital, no one's going to be able to hack into that medical device, you know, and I can go on by sector. Um, the second layer of trust is, is, you know, Chris alluded to, which is there needs to be a broader relationship between the private sector who runs and operates 90% of critical infrastructure in the U.S. government. You know, how is this going to work? What do you want from me as the private sector? And what should the government really be offering to the private sector in that that broader um, defense? And the third is the international domain, right? You know, I agree with Chris. We have not, uh, we have a long way to go after the last four years to assure our allies who believe and have a commonality of purpose of what needs to be protected, that we will be there for them. And in doing that, that means we have a collective defense. But if you can't trust the layers of the system, then, you know, we have broader systemic problems. So I think there's great opportunity, but I think we have to look at it in those three levels. And um, Andrea, uh, your, your ESG plus T angle, how do you see trust building? <laughs> the T is technology, T could be trust by either way. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, I, I underscore everything that Norma and everybody else said. I, we're in violent agreement with each other on what needs to be done. Um, but I, I'd like to, um, you know, put the trust piece in the context of tone from the top. Um, and we haven't had the right tone from the top, both in our own country uh, and therefore globally for a while. Uh, I think the change of administration is changing that, uh, certainly for uh, prioritizing cybersecurity within our country, but also then by implication, creating that more collective approach to solving the issue. So I think it comes from tone from the top. First and foremost, I think everything comes from tone from the top or lack thereof um, and just about anything in life. But uh, it, it happens at the at the global level with, with a country like the U.S. Uh, setting the right kind of tone and then uh, collectively participating and collaborating with the right kinds of, of allies. Um, and I think cyber is part of a trust uh, menu that we have to work uh, work with. And, and the ESG piece, and as, I, as uh, Val is kind to mention, I added a T to that in my recent book because I think 
environmental, social governance, and technology issues are all deeply intertwined. And the climate issue is the same. Pandemic is the same. Cyber is the same. Um, and, and we have others. We have other social justice issues. We have the rise of what uh, some people are calling stakeholder capitalism, where the stakeholders are demanding more from the power centers, whether they're governmental or business. And so we have a, an evolving world and the trust piece and the leadership piece is so critically important. We won't get anything done. And, and as, um, uh, as, as uh, one of uh, the, our colleagues here on the panel said, it really starts with um, making sure that everybody is um, uh, you know, collaborating with each other because if we don't do that, we're not going to get anywhere. And so I think all that said, I think if we can have uh, corporations doing the same thing, having that kind of uh, uh, tone from the top on these kinds of issues, you know, it, it applies also at the organizational level. So uh, long short, uh, I, I agree with everything that's been said. And I think that uh, we need to sort of bring it to the, to the organizational level as well. Great deal. Now, uh, thank you for your thoughts um, across the two topics we just uh you know, spoke about. Um, and I think, you know, the reality, though, is that uh, we are still have to deal with uh, the cyber threats that are out there. We have to you know, not only keep up with it, but get ahead, hopefully. And that needs a uh, consideration for resilience, right? Because uh, we are dealing with it as we speak every day, both personally, as well as citizens, um, as well as corporate uh, from an organizational standpoint. So maybe, you know, a few uh, next uh, few minutes, just a closing round of thoughts around um, the resilience part of it. Because I think even building the policy towards it needs to consider the fact that this will continue on. This threat is not going to go anywhere. And our risk management and mitigation areas around it will probably need to be as solid um, as on the policy part or as the trust building part is. So uh, in this, let me go around. Um, Andrea, I'll probably just start back up with you in terms of how can we be resilient in cyberspace? Well, I think it, again, starts with each entity being resilient and each leadership group or board or oversight uh, mechanism demanding that that organization uh, develop the resilience elements that are necessary for success. And that starts with the board, with, with the executive management, with the risk management, with cyber integrated properly, with enterprise risk management, with uh, cyber integrated properly, with resilience management, meaning crisis management, business continuity, data protection, um, doing the cyber hygiene that's so important, having the right relationships with the stakeholders and the supply chains. Uh, it's really taking responsibility for your own domain and then working, uh, you know, cross uh, organizationally with industry sector, with uh, private public and so on. And I think it also demands uh, a national approach to cyber resilience. I remember at one of the Cyber Future Foundation events in Davos that we attended a couple of years ago, uh, one of our friends from Estonia, who's a colonel in the Air Force said, uh, Estonian children of three and four years old are being taught cyber hygiene. And that has to happen everywhere. It can't just happen uh, in Estonia because they happen to be on the frontier of, of, of cyber attacks. It, we're all at the frontier of cyber attacks. So I think um, resilience starts with each of us, each of our organizations, families, uh, friends, communities, and, and businesses. And then the governments uh, really have to encourage that and have a national plan for that. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Andrea. Uh, Chris, how about your uh, your experience? I think, you know, it could, it could gain from both the, the diplomats, uh, diplomats uh, to get experience as well as the law enforcement experience because resilience uh, also means that we catch up to this, uh, the, the perpetrators of crime. Well, I mean, I, I think, first of all, domestically, I think we need to treat this issue again as something that's not some oddball issue, but part of, you know, we do, companies deal and governments deal with resilience all the time. This is not a new topic. So integrate that, when we think about cyber, integrate that too. Make sure that you, you know, one of the big problems with ransomware attacks is your, you know, your, uh, your data is locked up or your trade secrets are stolen. Well, deal with that. Assume that you're going to have these problems. How do you make sure you survive them and go on? Uh, internationally, I think it's institutional resilience. It's making sure that we have the right institutions in place. That's, you know, priority national strategies, what they call computer emergency response teams in countries that we can cooperate with, ways of going about these problems so that it's ingrained. And, and that's where capacity building, I think, plays a very important role. And, and my organization has 
governments, about 60 of them. We have private sector entities. We have civil society. So it's really multi-stakeholder. Uh, and we welcome others. And we just need to put more effort into that. Thank you. Uh, uh, how about uh, you, Jim, uh, on the on the topic of resilience? Yeah, two things. One, what Andrea said is absolutely true. We we need to just get people educated on this and to understand it. The other thing that I'd really like to see accelerate, although I'm starting to see it accelerate, is a convergence. As we start to connect things, and things are going to get more and more connected making sure that the systems, the processes, the protocols, the tools all work between themselves becomes ever more important. And that's going to be, you know, as you said, a challenge of truly making this part of the daily hygiene practice rather than some specialized, specialized. Absolutely. I think the more commonplace this um, this message goes and everybody understands, everybody contributes to lifting the baseline of cyber hygiene and security, um, I think there will be more uh, more progress in this space. So thank you, Jim. Uh, Frank, your thoughts on resilience? Well, I always like to, to, to speak in, in pictures. And, and as I said before, for me, it's it's like a journey on, on, on the road. So if, if, if I see this as a car, yeah, when you start the engine, um, you start your computer, um, and, and that, that's a moment where you start being vulnerable. Um, you have certain layers, um, in, in place in order to, to protect and make the journey as smooth as possible. And, and, and you have to make sure that when you, when you sit down, you have to put your seatbelt and the brakes are working and you have enough, uh, um, uh, oil or, or energy in the tank or not, not anymore the tank and the battery. Yeah. Um, and, and then when you're on the road, you have, you have signs, um, which is in, in a, a traffic light or something like that, which guides you. And that's coming from, 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 from the government. That's, a, that, that's, these are laws. But you still are the individual who are driving the car, um, and and you it's it's on you whether you you see the signs or not, whether you accept that, whether you put the um, um, the 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 seatbelt on or not, and and all this all of it starts with education. I mean, if you go if you go into a car and you start the first time, you have been educated, whether it's by your parents or later in, at the driving school, yeah. And, 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 and furthermore, with your experience and with more experience, you, you get used to it. You, you lose your fear on, on using the car. But still, something can happen. It's always there. It's, yeah, it's, we should not ignore the fact, but we are not stopping driving cars. Yeah? We, are, we, are, we are continue to be on the road and we are enjoying it going from A to B or we have to do this, whatever it is. But it is still there. And this, these layers we have to accept and then we have to look at our layers in the cyberspace, which are there, and put a frame around that, which gives the best comfort. As I said, it's we, we never can we can't ignore it anymore. It will be always there. It will be always we always will be vulnerable. But if we put all these layers around that, from government, from laws, from from the industry who who, who provide the, the, the technology against threats, but also from the knowledge. I think we can have a good way of, of moving around uh, with a topic and, and, and survive and, and, and enjoy still the ride. Oh, very well. I'll come back to that uh, and uh, to that topic probably pretty soon. But uh, Norma, you get the closing words. I love it. It's the last word. You know, one of the things I think that is important is we just need to be practical and pragmatic about this risk, right? We have to explain cybersecurity in a way that everyone can understand, and that's really a baseline. At the same time, though, we have to make clear cyber is the number one systemic risk to resilience that we have right now. It's not the only one, but it's the number one. And if we're also practical and pragmatic, then we need to understand if we're driving a car that's electric and we want everything to be electrified, if the entire grid goes down, what's the impact? There are no cranes at ports. Your cars don't work. You know, we need to think about these things, again, in just a very practical way. We're talking about smart cities that are connecting everything. You know, is that smart? Are we just giving a nation state or a non-state actor another tool to take down an American city? We're talking about autonomous vehicles. 
uh, and drones and ships. And yet again, cybersecurity is an afterthought. I mean, the fact that, that in the autonomous vehicle industry, they're using Wi-Fi updates and no one wants to talk about cybersecurity is just astounding to me. But again, if we focus on things that are very practical and pragmatic, understand your risk, understand what the outcome is, and then together we can share best practices to deal with it. But if we hide it under the cushions of the couch, and then when, you know, we all talk about cyber 9-11, you know, we, we're giving ourselves risk. So let's just manage the risk. Let's help give everyone tools to deal with it. And then let's find a way to make sure that we can work together to address it. Excellent. Excellent. I think great closing thoughts. So thank you always. We uh, hit the top of the hour. Um, I uh, really enjoyed uh, probably each of your viewpoints. Uh, hopefully those are able to join us or see this later are able to take away those points. And uh, uh, thank you, Andrea, Jim, Frank, uh, 